appreciate your work. Sure, sure. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Ye. I'm the co-founder and uh, ZK researcher at Scroll. So today I'd like to present an overview of ZK VM and what you are building at Scroll. So uh, for those who haven't heard of us, so what is Scroll? Like we are building a native ZK VM solution. So we have three missions. One is that we want to build an EVM equivalent ZK Rollup, which means we want to provide the best user and developer experience because you can do everything you do on Ethereum layer one, on our layer two. And second is that we care about decentralization. So we will achieve decent full decentralization step by step. Firstly, we will decentralize our pooling network, which basically like in your traditional ZK Rollup, you generate block yourself, you generate proof yourself, and then you submit the proof yourself. But what we are doing is that we will open this proof generation to a broader community, and they can use whatever hardware they want to use to help us generate the proof. And we can make use of their computation power for us and generate proof. And thirdly, that we are more open, because we are building an open source way. And actually, the CQM circuit part, we are co-building with the community. Uh, now let's talk about the uh, the the ZQM stuff and to to you know first let's just go over with the, some non-technical stuff to to fit the ZQM into this ZQ wrap diagram. So the problem of layer one is that you know each transaction needs to be broadcasted into a P2P network. It needs re-execution from every node. So this is inefficient, right? So the idea of ZQ wrap is that instead of sending every transaction in a P2P network, you send all those transactions in a layer two node. And then it will run some ZKP algorithm and generate proof. So this proof is more succinct and mathematically it's equivalent to for verifying the proof and the re-executing of the, the transactions. And so you only need to broadcast a very succinct proof instead of all the transactions and you, together with some, some, some data needed as public input. And now here comes the problem because if you want to generate the ZK proof, uh, you have to write, you know, re-implement your program logic using automatic circuit, which is a ZK language. So basically, you need to encode program logic in, in this circuit. For example, like if you want to build a DAX, you need to prove that your signature is correct, you have enough balance, and your, your path is updated correctly. And uh, so this is application specific, and it needs very strong expertise for, for people who are building those ZK rollups. Like they need to write ZK circuits, and also it needs very rigorous and careful auditing to make sure that you are not missing constraints. And, uh, and also it's application specific because you can only serve for certain type of transactions. For example, like Loopring serves for payments. And if you want to build something like Aave, uh, a specific ZK Rollup for, for Aave, you have to build some other circuits. And uh, even worse, like even you have all those application specific Rollups, there is still no compatibility because you know, every circuit will just for proof for their own Merkle tree. And you can't just directly have compatibility between different Rollups. You need some bridges. And for smart contracts, you also different, need different uh, verification keys. So that's the biggest motivation, like why it's not enough for building too many application specific rollups. And you need something which is more universal and you need to like, you know, very good developer experience. And uh, so the basic idea of ZK EVM is that instead of encoding the smart contract logic using a arithmetic circuit, you encode what Ethereum virtual machine is doing in this ZK EVM circuit. So basically it's a more general circuit. And, uh, your smart contract will just be the input of this ZKVM circuit. So basically what you need to prove is that the signature is correct, your smart contract is loaded correctly, and your execution trace is valid, and your storage is updated correctly. So this is the, the, like how ZKVM fit into this diagram of ZK rollup. And now here comes to the compa uh, comparison. So first, to, to, to understand the EVM, you have to understand how a smart contract is compiled and executed. So there are three different levels. In the first level, there is the language level. So that's for most Solidity developers. You are writing Solidity or any EVM compatible languages. And then from the language level, you, you, you compile that down to some intermediate representation. For example, you. It will, so, so this IR is different from, from EVM, even bytecode. It's more high level. It will still remain some high level semantics of your, your program and your Solidity code. But it contains enough detail for you to figure out you know, what's happening there. And then it's a bytecode level where it's EVM bytecode. And it's, it's well defined in the Ethereum virtual machine yellow paper. There is push, pop, add, and all those like, machine, machine language that, that can be executed on Ethereum virtual machine. And then and during the runtime, EVM will load the bytecode and uh, execute opcode by opcode. So that's basically the diagram of how you are executing this. And now, like, what's the key EVM? I will just, you know, like, say something from, from Justin Drake, and there are, so there are three flavors of the key EVM accordingly. So there is language level where you, you, you are transpile some EVM friendly, some EVM friendly language to a, 
to a ZK-friendly virtual machine. And secondly, the backcode level where you are interpreting EVM bytecode directly. So you are building something which is EVM equivalent because you are interpreting the EVM bytecode directly. But the trade-off you can make is that maybe you can have a different implementation for your storage and have a different state route because you know the Merkle potential tree RLP encoder is not defined in EVM yellow paper. And uh, the next is the end goal, like there is consensus level the EVM, which you know it's it's nearly Ethereum equivalent. So basically, you need to take one existing Ethereum block and then you can generate proof for you know for this Ethereum block moving from the state one to state two. So you are you are proving for the all the existing since they are on Ethereum, so that's the third level. And now, like, this is a more explicit comparison between different projects, like, you know, for, for Starkware, if you are developing a, a smart contract on, on Starknet, you need to write in their domain-specific language called Cairo. And uh, so, what you can do is that there is an external team, and they, they can build uh, some external compiler called Warp, and you can compile Solidity into some readable Cairo. And then it will compile down to some bytecode level, which is, is their kernel assembly, which is just a very small subset of assembly code, and then run that on, on, on their ZKVM. And for ZKSync, it's similar. Like they have some so circuit language called Zinc. And uh, to be compatible with Solidity, and they are reusing the LLVM co compiler infrastructure to be, to be compatible with different front-end languages. And so th this LLVM IR is mostly used in like, you know, uh, being compatible with the multiple high-level language, but you do, you know, like you can do a lot of optimizations in LVM IR and then compile down to some machine 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 code. And uh, so they are they are still like building something which is ZK VM, but they can, you know, uh, prove for their for their, their own defined uh, bytecode. And now like comes to a more a lower level, which is bytecode level, like what is what we are polygon Hermes and what we are building. And also like consensus and those efforts are building is that we want to achieve bytecode level compatibility or EVM equivalence. So basically you can reuse every compiler like the, to compile solidity and to compile down to bytecode. But there are some slightly technical differences that so for Polygon, they also have some th their, their own defined micro opcode sets. So basically, they have some interpreter to interpret this bytecode into some, some even a smaller set of micro opcode and then run on their virtual machine. But this can you know, still prove for, for bytecode level stuff. So what we are building is that we are building in a more straightforward way. Like, so there is bytecode, there is opcode in this bytecode, right? So we, we write some sub, sub circuit and uh, which is basically composed by some lookup arguments and some custom gates. And for each opcode, there will be some sub-circuit. And then like, directly compose them together to get our ZK EVM. So basically, you know, the, on the right, like, you, you get better compatibility, but on the, on the left side, you get better efficiency. So a little bit about the, why we are working along this path, because you, know, you are all experts, so I will just work through this very quickly. So first, you, you got the security inherited from EVM, right? Because this model has to test off time. For example, there are gas and a lot of well-defined stuff. And uh, secondly, you are compatible with all the infrastructures seamlessly, because you, you know, like for, for devs, you don't need to recompile. You can just take your existing bytecode. And, all, and also, like for wallets, toolings, and all those interfaces will be the same. And uh, even like we are using GAS as our execution node or sequencer. So it's basically, you know, for, for those developers who are really fam familiar with Go Ethereum implementation, you will experience exactly the same on our platform because your, your RPC and everything is the same. And uh, third is that, uh, you know, many people complain that, you know, the key is so hard to develop. But, you know, like I was just said from Vitalik, like, you know, there is a word called high encapsulated complexity. So basically it means it's hard for us to build such a complicated system. But, you know, for, for the interfaces exposed to the developer and the user, it's actually the best trade-off because, you know, everything is the same. And just, you know, it's hard for us to, to build. And also, like, if you build a ZK EVM in a modular way, you don't need to rely on any external compiler because every time, like, you need to upgrade to some compiler plus ZK EVM architecture, every time you make some modification, you also need to make some modification on the compiler part, so which, you know, just adds the complexity. And the third is that, you know, people worry about the efficiency problem of ZK EVM. But, you know, there are just two solutions. One is that there are more and more, like, technology in ZK, for example, there are cusp gates, lookup arguments, and recursive proof. We can make you, like, m aggregate multiple proofs into an even smaller proof and to reduce your verification cost. And second is that, you know, generating proof is costly but it's highly parallel. So you can basically using a, large, a lot of hardware acceleration and a lot of those techniques to make your proving faster. So there is ASIC, IPG, and GPU effort. And uh, so basically they can all make your proving faster. So I don't think, you know, proving time is really a, a big issue for us, especially in the long term. And lastly that, as I mentioned, like, you know, there is a consensus level, the key EVM, right? So uh, 
we definitely like you know because all layer tools are serving for some settlement layer or in other words it's Ethereum. So we definitely want to push for this end goal of Ethereum, like you know, they can everything. And so also like what we are building, a lot of credit go to the community. Like so there is like Ethereum Foundation apply the KP team and they are like all like we are we are building building this together. Yeah. So now like comes to more real technical part, like the ZK part and the architecture part. So the workflow of ZK EVM. So here, like um, I, I'm, I'm like talking about the, the community effort ZK EVM. So firstly, so uh, basically you have a sequencer, so which is a fork of gas node, and then like you know after receiving transaction, you will you will extract some some traces from this execution. For example, it includes execution logs, block header, transactions, and contra contract backcode, and Merkle proofs. So those are the traces you needed as a witness. And then you put this witness as input to, the, to fit that into a zk event circuit. So I use zk event circuit because it's actually composed of several sub-circuits. For example, like there is a Kachak circuit, there, is a lot, 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 there are a lot of sub-circuits, and each circuit will just ser serve for certain properties. And you need to compose them together to get your zk event circuits. And then, like, because you, you have so many sub-circuits, so you will generate multiple proofs. And finally, you use one aggregation circuit to reduce the, the verification cost, because you definitely don't want to verify too many proofs on, on layer one in smart contract. And then you get one aggregated proof and su submit that on layer one contract. And then together with the, the, some compressed data from, from, uh, from your transaction, and you can verify that the proof is correct. And uh, more specifically, on, on our platform, so there is two, two roles. One is sequencer, and the other we call them roller. So which is basically playing the, the role of, of, of prover. But you know, our roller is a, is a more decentralized proving system. So basically, what does that mean? It's, it means our sequencer will generate multiple blocks. And for each block, it will extract some traces. And for each trace, it will send to some stateless prover or roller in our network. And they can use whatever hardware they, they want to use to make you know, proving really faster and send back the proof. So basically, uh, we are using the computation power across the network. So that's our some speci something specifically to our platform. And now, like. I will introduce more ZK part, like you know how we are building ZK EVM circuit from a top-down uh, sequence. So firstly, in the top, you have a EVM circuit, which is a basically a, it's a it's a state machine, like you, you you have already heard from a lot of talks, like there is Jordi and Consensor talk. So EVM circuit is basically a state machine, and each state is just some you, you fill up some some opcodes and then some witness data related to this opcodes, and so in the EVM circuit we only constrain that this state machine is correct. For example, like you know. You, 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 you switch from state one to state two, and you need some constraints to constrain that this switch happens correctly and consistently. And also, like, you need to prove that your, your opcode uh, filled in, in those you know, slots or, or, or those states are correct, right? So for each opcode, you still need some, some sub-circuit for that. So here is the challenge one. Like, you know, there are so many ZK unfriendly opcodes, right? There is bitwise opcodes, which basically in ZK, like, you have to decompose every value into some bitwise value and then like you know have a lot of constraints for that and there is sha3 which you know it's just very hard to to prove like in zk circuits and so what we are building is that instead of checking everything in evm circuit we just assume that there is a table and uh, it stores all the information we needed for example like i will give you an example of the fixed table for example if you want to prove that some value is between zero and 10. So if you are, you are proving that directly, you need to decompose this value into like multiple bits and prove every bit is zero or one, and then you, you, you linear combine them to get your, your, your final, final value. But what you can do with this fixed table is that you can have a table, which is just you brute force from zero to 10. So it's this table you fill up one, two, and uh, until 10. And then you prove that your value is within this table. So if your value is within this table, it's definitely within the range between zero to 10, right? So that's the idea for, for lookup table. So every time we need to do some bitwise operation, we just look up a pre-processed table. And similarly, we can do the same thing for Kachak. For example, like in EVM circuit, there, sh there need to be some input of Kachak hash function, there need to be some output of hash Kachak hash function, but you know, it still needs some constraint to prove that it's, it's a correct output for Kachak, right? But we didn't prove that in EVM circuit, but we just assume that there is a table storing all the input for Kachak hash and the output for, for Kachak hash, and it's, it's just there. And we just look up whether this entry belongs to that table, and then if it belongs to that, which means this input and this output have this SHA-3 relationship. So that's, that's, that's for, for challenge one. Like, you know, we can, we can look up that in, in fixed table or Kachak table for, for the account friendly opcodes. And secondly, that you have, you, because EVM is a stack-based virtual machine, and, but 
but ZK is built for some register-based virtual machine because you, you have those cells, you have, you have transition functions and all those stuff. So basically what you do is that for each operand you are operating, you have a RAM table, like for, for even stack you have you, you need to pop two elements and push push one element back. And for each element, you will look up that in a RAM table. So this just assume that if, if it, it exists in the RAM table, then it's correct. Now just assume like, you know, every table is generated correctly, like without thinking, you know, like why, why it's there in the first place, but I will introduce later. So this is how we, we, we handle stack memory and storage. And there are still a lot of other stuff. For example, there is byte code, like for example, like you know, in, in your state machine, you are executing some some opcode, right? So you need to prove that this opcode is actually correctly fetched from this byte code. So you also need a byte code table for you to look up your, your program counter plus some opcode. If it's there, then it means you are you are using the correct opcode from this byte code byte code table. And there is also transaction table for proving that you know your signature is correct and some some transaction related data. And there is the block context table for for block context. Now, like, you know, here's the question, like, you know, in EVM circuit, you are always looking up something, right? You just assume that something exists in this table is correct, right? It, but but it's, it may not be, right? Because this table is actually also provided by you. So that's why you need so many sub-circuits. So there will be a cache circuit, which is a constraint for cache hash function, and it need to prove that all the, all the input and output in this cache table has the correct corresponding relationship. And for, for RAM table, because you are, you, are, you are proving for stack memory and storage, so you need, for storage part, you need a Merkle potential tree. So, in, so you have an MPT circuit, and then like, which is constraining this RAM table is generated correctly. And in this MPT circuit, because you, 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 you again, you, you, you need a cache right? So you, you look up the cache table again. So that's basically how you constrain everything, like for each, for each table, you will, you will have some, some independent circuit for constraining that this table is generated correctly. And for, for example, like for transaction, you, you have some signature table and you have some ECDSC circuit for constraining that. So that's basically the, the, the architecture of ZK EVM and a very high level overview of why we need those tables and how those tables work and how, how those constraints are constraining those tables. Now I will move into some even more technical detail for how to build this constraint. So this is more, a little bit more ZK, but you just, you know, like you, you need to get the high level sense is, is enough. So basically what, what we are using is that we are using some Planck optimization. So basically in Planck optimization, you have some witness table. So it's there, like, you know, as you show, like you, you can see in Jordi's talk or in consensus talk, they have some table, right? You need to fill up some values in this table. So there is witness and there's table one, table two. And so what you can define in, in, in Planck optimization is that you can define a certain area and you can define some relationships over the, for the cells in this rectangle. For example, like you can, you can define the first cell plus the second cell equal to the third cell and things like that. So here, like I, I quickly introduce, you know, some optimization which is different from Stark is that Stark is the, the use AIR, which is basically trans, they, they, they can, uh, they, they, can, they can from, 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 uh, from the first, first row, they can, they can prove that the, the second row and the first row has some correct transition relationship. So they can, they can prove that, you know, for each, for each row, they are just, you know, like, so, so, so they, they can only prove that some JSON rows are, have some correct relationship. But in Planck optimization, you can define something which is more flexible. You can define some, some you know, irregular rectangles and all those cells have some, uh, you know, relationships there. And that's one for, for defining custom gates. And secondly, that you can also define lookups. As I mentioned, like, you know, you can define those three, those three columns belong to those three columns. And you can define, you know, some entries belong to those, those three columns. And uh, so that's basically like, you know, you, you don't need to understand the, 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 the two technical detail, but basically after this, you need to understand that, you know, you can build two kind of constraints. One is that you can, you can you know, constrain uh, cells and whether they have some customer relationships. And you can also define some lookup relationships, defining whether an entry belongs to a, a lookup table. Now, like here, the, the EVM circuit. So the layout of the, the EVM circuit looks like, like this. So there are multiple slots. So in each slot, you will fill up some, some opcode and some opcode re related to wi related witness. So for example, like in this, in this, in this circuit, like I minus one is push, I is add, I, I, I plus one is multiplication, and although, you, you know, like for each slot, you will fill up some, some opcode. And then, like you know, let's take a deeper look at what's what's within this cell and what's what's a context there. So there are three different kinds. One is some co context. For example, it, it needs to store the context of state machine. For example, it needs to include the program counter, the stack pointer, and the guess. And uh, there is the opcode and case switch, which means you know if you are you are you are working on 
on a add cell, then you will, you will you know, fill up those cell with one. And then there is operating value which is specific to some opcode, and you can just, for example, like in add, you need to three, you need three variables, and you need some carries of proving that. So that's basically what you can define a, a, a rough layout for even circuit. And here, the more specific example, like as I said, you can define some really irregular rectangles, and you can define the relationships of those cells. For example, there is, if your case is add, which means in the next slot. You, you have already executed add, right? So your program counter need to plus one, and your stack pointer need to minus one, and your guess plus, you know, what, what you have already consumed. And here is like, like the constraint, like for, for constraining add, like, you know, those, those free cells and for, for constraining operand. So this is a bit too technical, and I just skip this, this part. And also for RAM table, like, because you are operating for A, B, and C, so you need, you need to look up this VA, and whether it belongs to the RAM table. So this is RAM table, and you have stack, memory, and storage, and you have address, and you, whether you are read or write, and your value. So you just look up that whether this exists in this RAM table, and then like you, after that, you, you use some RAM constraint to constrain this RAM table is generated correctly. So this is like, you know, so some more, e, more, more details, EVM circuit, and like, so this is, this is push. And so there are, actually, there are actually more features, like which is implemented in the, the given circuit, but we just haven't covered in this talk, like, you know, because we don't want to make this too, 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 too thick. Because, uh, for example, like, we, we also handle dynamic opcodes. For example, there is data, the core data copy, which has dynamic lens. And there is error cases, like out of gas error, and there is calls into some other contracts. And we also handle EIPs, such as some warm storage access list and transaction refund and all those stuff. So those are implemented, but, but it's just not, not covered in this talk. Uh, and finally, again, like we want to thank all the community members because we are not, you know, taking ownership of building this alone. There are a lot of people from this community. So first, there are people from Halo 2 who build this really flexible, fle flexible, like you know, way to, for us to build build those constraints. And also, like there are there are members from from this community who are co-building this with us. So really, really thanks thanks them. So that's basically all the contents related to the tech part. And finally, just our roadmap is that. Uh, in, in phase one, we will have some ZK EVM pro concept, and in phase two, we will have some ZK EVM testnet supporting some smart contract. And in phase three, as I mentioned, like we will also source this pool generation to a broader community. So that's layer two proof of sourcing. And in, in, in phase four, there will be ZK EVM mainnet. So there will be auditing and uh, proof of optimizations like during that period. And so, so finally, we also decentralize our sequencer and think about some way to go beyond EVM. Although, although, like you know, ZKVM is definitely more efficient, but you know, for, for massively migrate what, what's happening on Ethereum layer one, it's actually you need a ZKVM in the first place because you really want to solve the, the problem happening on, on Ethereum layer one. And uh, one last slide, like you know, we are hiring, and please check out our hiring, hiring, hiring page. And uh, thanks for that. Yeah, um, thank you very much. Um, guys, we have time for one question, maybe, before we move on to a panel. You're a lucky one. Hello. Um, so you mentioned a bit the relationship in the beginning between uh, efficiency and uh, the, the ease of use for developers. Um, have you already seen now kind of like the edge of of uh, diminishing returns for efficiency? Have you run, what bottlenecks have you run into in terms of efficiency? And do you see uh, a clear path to making transactions really cheap, like competing with the, the layer twos, uh, like uh, Polygon and stuff like that in, in the future? Yeah, or yeah, is that, it still unknown? Oh, yeah, yeah that, that's a good question. So basically, like, you know, all the, I think other layer twos who are building ZKVM or ZKVM, they don't have their reported data, and we don't have either. So it's just, the, the, so this efficiency is from theoretically, like, you know, whether some, some computation is friendly in ZK or not. So that's, you know, like when we are talking about something is more efficient or something is not, like it's more from a theoretical perspective. And uh, we definitely have some clear paths to, to make our program one more efficient. So as I said, like we have some roller network, which is a proving network. So there will be, we will generate multiple blocks uh, like simultaneously, and in parallel, we will dispatch them to, to some prover, and they can, you know, like all prove in, in parallel. And that's one, one thing, like one, one level of parallel. And secondly, that we will, you know, like we, we, we have already built some GPU solution to make that really fast. And also we are collaborating with some, some ZK hardware companies to, to make, you know, ZK ASICs to, to really, you know, like proving for, for this ZK event stuff. So like, you know, in the long term, I don't think that's really, 
really a big problem for for plural side. I uh, hope that I understand your question. Nice. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Thank you again. Thank you.